What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to episode number 254 of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast. This is the Hot Tags edition for the week, where I'm going to be breaking down some of the current events, rumors, and news going on in the world of pro wrestling from the past few days. I am your host, Tony Mango, and I'm flying solo for this episode, but don't you worry, there is plenty for me to talk about and to give you guys a full episode here because, man, the hot tags have just been heating up in the past few days. We've got injuries, we've got stabbings, we've got sex and lies and videotapes and, well, we don't really have videotapes, but we have everything really under the spectrum you can possibly imagine from the world of pro wrestling. It's a weird world and we need to start breaking it down with our main topic for this issue, I guess. I don't know if you would constitute this the main one, but it's at least going to go up on the thumbnail because, man, it's the most, uh, like, tantalizing of the bunch. Ric Flair, out of nowhere, starts talking about how he slept with Halle Berry after she got divorced. Which is, like, on its own... It's just hilarious to think that this would come up in a conversation and he would just kind of be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I fucked uh, Halle Berry. And of course, you know, Halle Berry's team, she talks about how that's not true. She doesn't even necessarily know who he is, let alone had any kind of romantic affair with him, so on and so forth. You really have essentially he said, she said, although it's the words of a top 10 a 10 out of 10 gorgeous Hollywood A-list superstar who could get any woman, or any woman, well, she could get any woman too, but any man that she wants, and Ric Flair, who is, how old is Ric Flair? Let me look this up real quick. We joke about his age all the time, but I don't know his actual age off the top of my head. He is 67 years old, clearly not in his prime anymore, and, I mean, if we were talking about Ric Flair from back in the 70s, and somebody of an equivalent of a Halle Berry back then, I would believe him. I mean, he used to slay all the time. He was he had that character for, you know, multiple reasons. He spent his money like he had ten times more than he did. And he uh, was, you know, talk of the talk, walk of the walk, all the other kind of things like that. And we're talking about Ric Flair from circa 61 years old, something like that. And Halle Berry? Uh uh. I don't buy it whatsoever. If he did, though, man, I gotta give props to the, uh, the guy for that because if he, in his older age, was able to nail Halle Berry, figuratively and literally, props, dude. <laughs> uh, he probably doesn't know who she is, though, for real, and he might have just had sex with some random person who claimed to be her, looked enough like her, and he was just like, cool, I'll add that as another notch under my belt. Uh, but I really would trust Halle Berry's camp more than Ric Flair. Either way, I assume that the whole story of this whole thing means we're not going to get any more WWE Studios films from her in the future, so that's positive, right? I guess? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that this was such a weird, weird story, and it's hilarious, and it's clickbait, too, I have to admit that, so, um, of course I needed to talk about that. I really want to know what you guys have to think about this whole story, and all the other ones that I'm going to talk about as well. Anything that you guys uh, want to chime in on, just uh, leave your comments below. If it's about a particular topic that we might not necessarily know what you're referencing, then just put a little timestamp so we know, you know whatever the joke is in reference to or something like that. But, man, Ric Flair and Halle Berry. Could you imagine that? I certainly can't. Uh, what else do we have here? We've got two different stabbings. The first one was Jamie Noble was stabbed twice outside of his home in West Virginia Wednesday morning. And uh, they haven't caught the guys yet. He posted something up on his Facebook. I can't remember if it was Facebook or Twitter, but um, he's asking, you know, if anybody knows any information to let the cops know, let him know, etc. He's going to give people like $200 or $500 if they end up catching the people and stuff like that, which, of course, is nice. But you really shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff for money. You should be doing it because people who stab people should be getting arrested and they should get their comeuppance. But... He wasn't the only one that was stabbed. Uh, Alberto Del Rio no-showed a AAA Heroes Immortales X event. I'm assuming 10. 
and uh, my accent uh, pronunciation of that kind of stuff is terrible, so I'll never do that again, I promise. Eh, maybe I will. I don't know. If it's that annoying, maybe I'll do it just to kind of piss you guys off. But <laughs> he no-showed it, and in typical Del Rio fashion, I, at the very least, I'm sure many others thought he was just no-showing it because he wanted more money, or he decided he didn't want to do it, or whatever. Well, story ends up coming out that he got stabbed outside of a restaurant. So... We've got clowns all over the place now. People are dressing up as clowns and threatening to shoot up schools and stuff like that and posting death threats to people on Facebook and other social media platforms and just creeping people out. Now we've got wrestlers being stabbed twice in a week, though. That's, like, really... I mean, it's odd enough that when I started typing Jamie Noble was stabbed into the Hot Tags notes a couple days ago, that was like, wow, this is a really odd story. And then Del Rio gets stabbed, and it's like, most things run in threes. Really don't hope to have a third stabbing for, like, the hot tags next week or something like that. Or even worse, the hot tags, like, uh, tomorrow, and I ended up recording all this, and we don't have uh, the time to do that. Because I ain't doing a small package for that, unless somebody dies, unfortunately, which hopefully that doesn't happen either, but... Uh, two stabbings, Del Rio and Jamie Noble. Now, both of them are doing all right, from what has been said. Del Rio apparently is still going to even like wrestle and Jamie Noble's recovering and he's, you know, resting up and whatever and uh, feeling better day by day, he said. So it's obviously a positive that both of those guys weren't really seriously injured in any further capacity. I mean, I don't love Jamie Noble as a performer. He was never one of my favorites, but of course I don't wish anything bad on the guy. And the same thing for Del Rio. As much as I don't like Del Rio in a lot of different ways, I don't want the guy to get stabbed. So hopefully the people that were responsible for this end up getting arrested and they serve their jail time or whatever the proper punishment is. And Jamie Noble and Del Rio get uh, healed up quick enough that they can kind of get back into the swing of things and not have any kind of other health issues that are lingering after that. But man, that is crazy, isn't it? We get two people stabbed in a week. I don't know why they necessarily would have gone straight to stabbings. I mean, the Jamie Noble one was supposedly because he had cut somebody off when they were driving, which, man, it's scary enough driving around, isn't it? You got these, like, alcoholics that drive. You've got people who just don't know how to drive. I mean, most people are stupid enough that they don't even know what a turn signal is. And if, uh, you know, you get stuck behind one of these people, that they've got the road rage stuff going on with them too, then you got to unfortunately deal with that. You got people that shoot people because they were cut off and just... People are fucking nuts. I can't stand this world. So you you stab a guy because he cut you off. You follow him to his uh, trailer park home, which why is Jamie Noble living in a trailer park anyway? That doesn't make any sense to me. He clearly should make enough money to be able to move out of that. Maybe he just likes it. I don't know. I mean, he comes from that kind of an area, so maybe that's his preference. But hey, uh, the double wide from Heath uh, Slater getting that tag title thing. Maybe they should sort of go into real estate business by themselves. But um, yeah, uh, I think that this is just kind of, it's sad to hear about that kind of stuff because it just shows how fucking crazy everybody is in this world. Del Rio's side, I haven't heard much about why he was stabbed for that reason. Maybe he was kind of uh, bringing it on upon himself a little bit more. I have to imagine Jamie Noble is not as adversarial as Alberto Del Rio is. Maybe Del Rio pissed somebody off and he pissed off the wrong guy. Or maybe Del Rio cut somebody off. Or maybe somebody else just really doesn't like Del Rio even more than I don't. So I wish that the guy shits himself. I don't want to stab him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we joke about that kind of stuff, but we obviously don't wish anything negative upon anybody because that's a horrible thing to do. And I'm not that terrible of a person. Bad one, but not that terrible. And unfortunately, that's not the only injury slash sort of injury thing that we have to talk about. Eric Rowan has undergone surgery for a torn rotator cuff. So they have not yet uh, said anything about how long he's going to be out, but I'm assuming at the very least a couple months, handful of months or so. And that's really not too big of a deal. Eric Rowan was just a supplemental person on SmackDown, and it didn't seem like they were really pushing him all that much, but you know, maybe this actually can end up being a good thing in the long run. The separation of Rowan and Wyatt is really not going to hurt either one of them all that much. Rowan is a jobber. At best, he's been a jobber to the stars when he's been on the positive side of the things of the Wyatt family, but he's always been the one that loses. So that's not really going to hurt him all that much going forward. He's going to come back, and he's probably going to lose unless they repackage him. 
And if they separate him and Wyatt long enough, where Bray Wyatt now doesn't have Braun Strowman or Luke Harper to back, fall back on either, maybe Eric Rowan comes back and he actually gets some kind of a new character or something. He's a big guy. He can move around pretty well for a big guy. And he tried doing the baby face, smart kind of Eric Rowan gimmick. But that didn't really work all that well because he was still just Eric Rowan wearing the same garbage man jumpsuit and losing. So who knows? Maybe this is going to be a blessing in disguise. Maybe Bray Wyatt having to do stuff on his own is going to have to pick up the steam a little bit. Or maybe this actually works a little bit more into the favor of Luke Harper. Because Luke Harper, I think, would succeed so much more on SmackDown than on Raw. And if he ends up going to Raw, then... I mean, he might succeed there too. Maybe he could do Luke Harper versus Braun Strowman in the future. But I'd really rather see Luke Harper versus Bray Wyatt. I don't know about you guys, but that's how I'd like to see things go. And Eric Rowan, when he does come back, maybe they could have a triple threat. We've been wanting that triple threat for a long time, and we still have never gotten it. So you get, like, maybe a heel Bray Wyatt, a babyface Luke Harper with a repackaging, and a tweener sort of Eric Rowan with a repackaging. That could be a cool show for, I don't know, um, maybe Royal Rumble? Maybe Fastlane? Hell, maybe even WrestleMania. I doubt it, but you never know. There could be enough room on the card, depending on how they end up organizing other people and throwing people in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and stuff like that. But uh, Eric Rowan will be out at least for a little bit. Torn rotator cuffs are not something where he just takes a week off and comes back. So hopefully uh, we wish him a speedy recovery as well. He's not the only person that got injured this week, though. Natalia lost two of her front teeth at a SmackDown Live event, and pretty much right afterwards, she goes to the dentist, she gets them all fixed up, two brand new teeth, kind of the same as what happened with The Miz about, what, uh, seven months ago or so with uh, AJ Styles? He just had that new tooth put in and was raring to go the next night, and Natalia wrestled on main event and lost to Naomi, so she's already wrestling. So that's a hell of a lot. Uh, more of a pain tolerance than I've got. I'll give it to tell you that. If I have like a toothache, I'm pretty much complaining about it all day, maybe even the next day or so. And if I were to have a tooth pulled, I'm sure I would milk all the the pity that I would get out of that. She gets two front teeth knocked out and gets it replaced and all that and goes right back to, you know, getting beaten up and stuff. And tough girl. They all are. Everybody who is in WWE is tough. Far tougher than I am. And uh, Natalia proving that she's on that list as well. So hats off to Natalia for being able to get those replaced real real fast and still uh, doing her commitments to the SmackDown roster. Thankfully, she doesn't have a match at No Mercy, so maybe she could take a little bit of the weekend off, eat some ice cream, whatever. Uh, actually, that's probably a horrible idea with that. Ice cream's supposed to be for the tonsils, not with the teeth. That's probably like the sensitive teeth thing. Don't eat ice cream, Natalia. That's a bad idea. I'm not a doctor. Don't listen to me. Or a dentist. Um, a returning uh, woman to the roster, though, is Emma. There was a little video package that showed basically just some pictures of her, which she looks great in pictures, and uh, you can't really complain about that, but it said something pretty interesting. Emma is going to be returning to the Raw not necessarily as Emma. She's going through a sort of a makeover, and she's going to be Emma Lena. I don't know where that's going, and that kind of makes me a little bit nervous, because first off, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, I want Emma to go back to SmackDown more than Raw, but Raw's hurting a little bit right now, they can probably use her, so it makes a little bit of sense for her to go on Raw, but the Emmalina thing, that could be really good, or it could be really bad, because Emma so far has had basically two characters on the roster. She's had the, for lack of a better word, bubbly girl who pops the bubbles and has that really annoying theme. And then she's had the aviator shades, uh, anti bubbly person who doesn't pop bubbles, but has an equally annoying theme. And really Emma has been somebody who just doesn't really know where she's going. I think her heel character in some ways was better than the baby face one. Some ways the baby face one was better, but neither of them really worked all that well for me. I had my issues with both of them. And I don't know if that's because it's Emma or it's because she just hasn't found her groove yet. Maybe she has no groove. I don't know. But this Emelina thing, by far, I have to assume this is going to be a heel gimmick. 
they need heels. Nia Jax is nowhere near ready to pick up the slack. Paige is apparently injured or whatever, and who knows if she's even going to return. So they've got Bailey and they've got Sasha Banks. That's good enough for the baby faces. Dana Brooke eventually is going to turn on Charlotte, and when that happens, then Dana Brooke will be a baby face, although I don't think she's really going to do that well as a baby face, so we'll have to see about that. But Charlotte is really holding their own, and then eventually I think Sasha Banks is going to turn heel, but we'll get to that in the future. Just putting it out there, Sasha Banks versus Bailey. It's going to happen. And uh, I think that Emelina could be a good resurgence if it's the right type of character, but we have no real indication of what that's going to be yet. If it's just going to be Emma being the same heel, but with a name change, then I don't really care after a week. If she's going to change her ring gear up, then that's a little bit disappointing because her ring gear looks really good on her. She's got a fantastic body, but maybe it's even better. You know, if you upgrade the, uh, the sexiness then I'm not going to complain, but uh, Emelina, the name is a little bit weird. It just reminded me of Thumbelina, <laughs> which is not something I should be equating to a heel on a wrestling program. And maybe, uh, maybe this is going to be a little bit straining on her relationship with Zack Ryder being on different rosters. That's not really a positive, but maybe that's the right spot for her. I don't know. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, everybody drop your comments below. Tell me what you think is going to end up happening. What should this Emelina character be? And are you excited for her to join the Raw roster or anything else like that? But while we have Emma or Emelina returning to the roster, we have three people who are going to be leaving the roster. Hugo Knox has been released from NXT, as is CJ Dunning, and Tough Enough winner Sarah Lee. Now, as far as my opinions about these three, I don't remember ever seeing Hugo Knox wrestle, although I might have seen him lose in some kind of an episode of NXT or something, so I can't really say too much about that. But uh, for any of these three pe uh, people, if they realized that this wasn't their passion, and if they weren't necessarily talented enough and not making enough progress, that WWE felt that they needed to cut them, then you know what? It's the best uh, thing to do because why waste a whole lot of time and money and effort, and management skills and all the other things that you would be wasting if somebody is not going to pan out in the end. Some people turn things around. Most people tend not to. And maybe Hugo Knox is one of those people that just wasn't built for wrestling. He, he looks like it, but I mean, pretty much anybody who's muscular and tall enough and strong enough or whatever looks like they could be a part of wrestling. And the same thing kind of applies to CJ Dunning. Beautiful girl, really hot. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be seeing more of her, but, uh, you know, she could just go back to modeling or doing any kind of fitness things that she does. Maybe she's like a personal trainer or something. Uh, I, I don't know anything really about those two, so I can't really speak on any specifics, but if CJ Dunning was a part of that group that just isn't getting it and maybe just doesn't want to be a wrestler, tried it out and failed or whatever the case may be, then, you know, good riddance, I guess, but, uh, same that we can't really see more of her because she's really, really attractive. And the same kind of applies a little bit to Sarah Lee, although we know a little bit more about her situation. Sarah Lee is apparently pregnant. So congrats to the couple, which the other half of that is Wesley Blake. And I talked earlier about how if Ric Flair was able to pull Halle Berry, that I'd give him a fist bump. But I got to give one to Wesley Blake. I mean, Sarah Lee is super cute. And uh, I would have never seen those two be in a couple. Same thing kind of applied with Alexa Bliss and Buddy Murphy, but I have to say, Buddy Murphy's a better looking guy than Wesley Blake, so uh, Sarah Lee and, and Wesley Blake was a, a combo that really confused the hell out of me, but hey, you know what? When somebody gets pregnant, you gotta release them, because look at what happened with Rosa Mendez. I have no clue why Rosa Mendez is still on the roster. We've talked about this ad nauseum, but I still have to mention it in case there's new people out there. Rosa Mendes has been terrible for her entire career, and she has just been utterly useless. And they, they've they kept her around since she's been gone, and she's been gone for two years now, I think. Now, there's a certain amount of time that you're obviously going to be away when you find out that you're pregnant because you can't wrestle and you can't do any kind of physical activity that's going to be harmful to the baby and your own health and stuff. But Rosa, at least when she was hanging out with the Total Divas stuff, she was being used in some capacity, and Sarah Lee, she wasn't really doing anything. I mean, she wasn't even really a big part of Breaking Ground, which that was surprising to me, because I figured that would be, like, one of the main things that you would try to focus around would be the NXT stars that came from Tough Enough, because they are even further uh, 
behind than the rest of the people. They ended up focusing on other people like Tyler Breeze and such, which that was a lot of a lot of fun, and I really kind of want them to bring that show back. But Sarah Lee wrestled basically just some live events, and that's it. She never made her main roster debut, of course, because I don't think she ever actually made a debut on NXT TV. And she's going to be gone for a bunch of months, and uh, I got a feeling this is the last that we'll ever see of her. I don't think she's going to end up coming back. She had that $250,000 contract. I think that's what it was, right? Two hundred and fifty. And, you know, she was a part of NXT for the live shows, at least. And maybe they got a little bit of use out of her that way. But she's going to be a mom. And uh, being a parent is going to be the number one priority. So I got a feeling Sarah Lee's not coming back to the roster. And that's a little bit of a shame. But I don't know what she was as far as the talent scale goes. So maybe she was bad enough that we're really not going to miss her other than her cute little face. And Wesley Blake is already... uh, Calling that his own, so boo. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Tournament. They have revealed all 16 teams, and I'm going to just run them down real quick here, then get into a kind of separate offshoot topic that goes along with it. But we've got The Revival, DIY, the Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa Tag Team, which that DIY name is just not working. And the WWE's uh, website that actually ran down the list of these people just referred to them as Gargano and Ciampo, uh, Ciampa. They know that the DIY thing's not catching on. So, um, you know, DIY though. Uh, with the revival, we've got Andrade, Cien, Almas, and Cedric Alexander. Spoiler alert, they've already been eliminated. We have Bobby Roode and Ty Dillinger. Spoiler alert, they've already been eliminated, and I'm pretty sure that they're going to end up facing each other at NXT TakeOver Toronto, which that'll be really cool because I like both those guys. We have Tino Sabatelli and Riddick Moss, Hideo Watami and Kota Ibushi. Talk about him again in a few minutes. We have the Bollywood Boys. They've already been eliminated, I know that. There's also TM61, which... I still don't know if they're supposed to have a hyphen between those, the TM hyphen 61 or TM space 61 or TM 61 with those spaces. I don't know. I think it's a hyphen, but it's still bugging me. We have, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly. Nico Bogojevic, Bogojevic, Nico Russian. We're just going to call him and Tucker Knight. Two guys. I know literally nothing about. I know I've heard the name Tucker Knight before. That's it. We also have the Authors of Pain. I'm sure that they're one of the favorites to end up winning this. Ho Ho Loon and Bin Wang, the Chinese... <laughs> Sorry, it's still just fucking funny. <laughs> Bin Wang. Um, there's my uh, 12-year-old self coming out. <laughs> Bin Wang was the Chinese superstar that they just signed really recently, and they're already kind of putting him in the mix with this. But I'm assuming that Ho Ho Loon and Bin Wang... Trying so hard not to laugh here, but I have a smile on my face. Uh, that they're not going to really make it that far because he is still brand new, and they can't really put that much on somebody. Ho oh, Loon, he's not brand new, but that's why he'll probably do the majority of the match, and then they'll lose to Authors of Pain or whoever. Uh, we have Lindsay Dorado and Mustafa Ali, two guys from the Cruiserweight Classic. That sounded cool to see. Another Cruiserweight Classic guy is Rich Swan, and he's going to be teaming up with No Way Jose. That team makes a lot of sense to me. And you know what? If they click, I could see them being a legit, real tag team. So I really like that pairing. You got No Way Jose. He's dancing around. Rich Swan is dancing around. They're both kind of these weird, sort of comedic characters, but they aren't jobbers exactly. So that's a good pairing. I actually really, really commend them on that one. Something like the Lindsay Dorado and Mustafa Ali, that doesn't really make all that much sense to me. So... You know, try a little harder for some of them. Make it a little easy for some other ones. Tony Nice and Drew Gulak. Ugh, hate that name. Uh, those two make a little bit of sense because they are both in the Cruiserweight Classic as well and that they're more of like the technician kind of guys, but I'm still just nowhere near on par with that. Uh, the No Way Jose Rich Swan one. That makes way too much sense. We also have Sanity. The two members of that are going to be Alexander Wolf and... Sawyer Fulton, if I remember correctly. And Eric Young is a part of that, and so is uh, Nikki, but they're not going to be a part of the tag team tournament. So those two, I'm pretty sure, are going to be also some favorites to move on, along with TM61 and possibly DIY, The Revival. 
there's, you know, a little bit of room here for like some surprises and stuff. And our last tag team that is a part of this is Austin Aries and a mystery partner. Now, when I was saying earlier that I would be referencing a couple little things here, one thing I have to talk about is that mystery partner. Rumor has it, it's Roderick Strong from ROH. That is another guy that I know virtually nothing about, but I've heard a lot of really, really good things. And apparently he and Austin Aries have a backstory together that they've tagged up in the past and such. Of course, wrestled each other when they were a part of the same companies and everything, but Roderick Strong, if he comes over to NXT, and if he's a good enough talent like people are saying that he is, big thumbs up for that one. You can never have more than enough talent. It's never going to be a bad thing. If he and Austin Aries have good chemistry together, then you know what? Maybe we got a feud down the line. Maybe we got a tag title reign down the line. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe he's just a part-timer and they're bringing him in here for like a test run. Maybe he loses that one match with Austin Aries and we end up having Hideo Itami versus Austin Aries outside of that. But part of the reason I mentioned that is because Kota Ibushi is tagging up with Hideo Itami. And Kota Ibushi recently just said there is absolutely zero chance that he's going to go full-time with WWE but he's open to doing more, you know, uh, side kind of guest spots and stuff like that. So I think right there means you can eliminate Hideo Itami and Kota Ibushi from the mix. And Hideo Itami has been feuding with Austin Aries, which usually would mean by now in the same kind of capacity as Bobby Roode and Ty Dillinger. Roode and Dillinger lost their match, and it would look like that they're going to have a match together. Hideo Itami and Austin Aries are on opposite teams, but maybe both those teams end up losing, and then we could have a singles match at NXT TakeOver Toronto. That would move Roderick Strong to either just, you know, kind of sit on the sidelines, or maybe he's not completely done with his Ring of Honor stuff, and maybe they can't bring him into NXT yet. Then you wait a little bit. We got a month, two months, whatever long it takes. Austin Aries and Hideo Itami can wrestle their singles match, and that way you can kind of keep that storyline going. Plus, we have more than enough tag teams still left in this mix, only four have been eliminated so far. And, uh, you know, a couple of these stand out, like I mentioned. Pretty sure that Sanity is going to be either in the semifinals or the finals. Same thing with Revival and DIY and TM61. But maybe we get something weird. Maybe uh, Ho Ho Loon and Ben Wang go a little bit further than they're supposed to. Or maybe Ho No Way Jose and Rich Swan get to the semifinals. I don't know. Very interested to see that. But I do think that with Kuda Ibushi saying that there's zero chance that he's going to be full time WWE. It's, number one, a bad sign for his team in the uh, Tag Team Classic, and it's also a little bit of a disappointment for the Cruiserweight division, because Kota Ibushi had great matches, and he more than lived up to his reputation. So, I don't know, maybe it's just a matter of them needing to uh, scratch his back a little bit more, maybe they give him a little bit more money and he'll stick around, or maybe he gets to know some more of the people, does more guest spots, and starts to really like the atmosphere. Maybe he comes along. Maybe he's just too old for it, doesn't want to continue doing that on like on the road and all the other kind of commitments that you have with WWE. Whatever the case may be, I really would like to see Kota Ibushi sign. And if Roderick Strong is going to be signing as well, you know, I'll uh, end up watching his match and see if I like him or dislike him or whatever the case may be. But... Excited to hear about more people coming into the company that were supposedly good, possibly great. Big thumbs up when it comes to that. So that should about do me in. Usually try to aim for about a half hour here, and we're about like the 28 minute or so mark. So I want to know again what you guys have to say about all these different topics. We've got the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, tag teams broken down. We've got Ric Flair, supposedly, maybe not, fucking Halle Berry, Emelina. Natalia losing her teeth, Eric Rowan going away with surgery, two stabbings, three people released from NXT. All this kind of stuff is happening all in one week, everybody, and who knows what's going to happen over the next few days. But if anything huge happens, then of course we'll do some kind of a small package. If we end up wanting to do something different, then maybe we'll add something different into the mix. But at the very least, I know for sure we've got the IWC outreach coming up a little bit later on this week, probably tomorrow, depending on when you're listening to this. And then after that, we're going to have No Mercy predictions because we got that pay-per-view coming up on Sunday, which means, of course, that we're going to have the NXT, not the NXT, the No Mercy pay-per-view post-show immediately following that event, which if you didn't listen to the mailbag and you're curious about what's happening with the live pay-per-view post-shows, those might be going away. I'm looking into possibly doing YouTube Live or maybe Facebook Live streaming, 
but no matter what, they will be recorded in some capacity and uploaded to YouTube. So eventually Sunday, late Sunday night, early Monday morning, Monday afternoon, whenever the case may be, you will be able to see that. And we'll be going down all the stuff with the pay-per-view point stuff, predictions and spoilers and review wise a little bit later on, but that's it for the hot tags edition. Everybody. Thank you all for listening. This has been another smart out moment and I'm being counted out. Thank <laughs> you.